Hello and welcome to another edition of the Dakota Leader with Brianna Sagdahl. I'm joined this afternoon by Carly Healy. Is that how you say your name, Carly? Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're going to be discussing about uh, recent events in here related to Senator Julie Fry Mueller, but also in the broader context of capital culture. So without further ado, Carly, thank you so much. And um, what was your, actually, let me backtrack a little bit. So you were an intern for Representative Tim Goodwin, who in fact ran against Julie Fry Miller uh, during this last primary, right? Mm, yes. And so you were in the Capitol with him in 2021. Yes. And you actually had an interaction with the uh, LRC staff member mm -hmm. who this situation is sort of revolving around. And we now know her name is Amanda because of the leaked complaint that was either uh, given to the press by Senate leadership or it was leaked to the press. I'm not exactly sure which. Um, but can you can you tell me a little bit about your time in the Capitol, um, your experience as a woman with the Capitol culture in Pierre? and anything that um, might be relevant to that topic at this time. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, as you were saying, I uh, interned for Representative Tim Goodwin, and he had his own agenda going on um, where he was seeking to um, unseat Tony Randolph and Tina Mullally in District 35, uh, that, which is why he recruited Democrat Mayor Larry Larson to run uh, to ch actually not just to run, but to change his voter registration from Democrat to Republican in just right before time to get on the primary ballot. Interesting. And so what was the motivation for unseating Representative Tony Randolph, who happens to be the only black man in the legislature, uh, interestingly enough, um, and then Representative Tina Mullally, did he say what his sort of agenda was there? His agenda had to revolve around um, Ellsworth Air Force Base. Interesting. So maybe funding or uh, pork, as as we call it. Mm, fascinating. And so are you able to explain a little bit more about what that deal might have looked like for him personally or for the district, perhaps? Can you rephrase that? Um, so if he was working to actively unseat Randolph and Mulally, um, I would imagine there is something that he feels he would be getting out of that, either personally or for the district that he felt um, might have been you know, beneficial to the individuals who live in the district. Hmm. Yeah, either having to do with, you know, like you said, pork funding or uh, just even to, well, Tony was actually the chairman of the House Military Veterans Affairs Committee. And so I was also Tony's intern as well. So that kind of plays into this as well, that um, Tim was kind of essentially put me in a situation where I had to choose between the two of them. Interesting. So now, um, Following that time, you had filed a complaint with LRC, is that correct? Yes, in uh, December of 2021. Okay, December of 21. Would you mind sharing that complaint with us? Of course, let me pull that up. Thank you. All right, and then um, we'll, we can just kind of go through it, and then if you have any questions, like if I say something super relevant or whatever and you want to stop me just let me know okay so this is addressed to amanda marsh from the legislative research council dated december 21st 2021 official complaint tim goodwin i interned for house military and veterans affairs committee uh, chairman tony randolph house state affairs house agriculture and natural resources and House Majority Whip Tim Goodwin during the 2021 legislative session. During the last week of session at the NRA Pheasant Feast in the basement of the Pier Art Theater on 109 South Pier Street, on a day I don't recall, 
Tim Goodwin was introducing me to the former attorney general, Marty Jackley. Tim Goodwin said, we've got to get rid of her, to which Marty Jackley responded in a hushed whisper. Careful, she just walked in. And the woman that they were referring to was the District 35 representative, Tina Mullally, who is my representative. And so I found this to be suspicious and it piqued my curiosity. Uh, on the last day of session, I asked Tim Goodwin, are you getting rid of me? Echoing back to the comments that he made about Tina Mullally. He responded playfully, I'm not getting rid of you. I know where you live. I bantered back, where do I live? He hummed and then asked me to remind him. I described the general location. I'm gonna skip over this part. Um, he invited me to a GOP meeting back in Rapid City at the Hotel Alex Johnson. After the meeting, he introduced me to Ed Randazzo, saying, this is my intern Carly, and she told me that she wants to run for District 35 House. He asked me and my husband to meet him over at the GOP office, where he introduced me to Jeff Holbrook using that exact same line. I found it odd that he introduced the idea in such a matter, putting words in my mouth, placing me on the hot seat with influential people. I was intrigued by the idea of running for office, but at the time I felt very uneasy with how he had appointed himself with the authority to speak on my behalf, acting as if he had hired himself to be my talent manager. I returned to Pierre for veto day. Representative Trish Ladner said to me that she heard I was running, to which I responded coyishly, oh, that's what Goodwin says. That evening, Sydney Powers, Ashley Gustafson, uh, Elizabeth Benzmiller and I went out to eat at a restaurant. Those are the other female uh, interns. Thank you. I, do, I do not recall the name of the restaurant. Senator Dave Johnson arrived. I'm not sure why he was there or who invited him. But he patted me on the back as he approached our table, saying that he heard I was running. Again, I responded coyishly. Oh, that's what Goodwin says. He took the seat next to me and began gossiping with the girls about the other legislators and eventually directed his attention towards me, saying, and that disgusting Tom Pischke, but I don't know, maybe you like him. Senator Johnson asked, trying to drag me into the workplace gossip. This made me feel very uncomfortable. I planned to politely confront Goodwin about the rumors he had been spreading to other legislators about my alleged campaign for the state house. I asked if he and Marsha would have Jason and I over for dinner, but they were gone on holiday at their East River Lake House. And it wasn't until the first summer committee meeting on medical marijuana when I was finally able to track Representative Goodwin down. Before returning to Rapid City after the second day of committee, I asked if we could meet for dinner, and we met at the Perkins in Fort Pier. Here, I confronted him about this supposed mysterious opportunity to run for the State House. I told him that I was interested in learning more. He told me to contact a Box Elder City Hall employee named Nicole Schneider. At this meeting, I was told that there would be little financial investment on my part because of people who want to help. This was very alarming. I said that I have no friends or family here to help with my campaign, and she then assured me that this would not be an issue. I was advised not to speak to Representative Mullally and Representative Randolph, among others, because they are willing to use unscrupulous means and backhanded politics. Nicole Schneider asked me to get in touch with Senator Jessica Castleberry, saying that she would tell me more. I was told by Senator Castleberry that Lee Schoenbeck would easily fundraise over $10,000 for my primary race alone. She told me that Representative Mullally and Representative Randolph, um, oh, sorry, there's an error there, and warned me that they were going to stalk my house and go through my trash. Toward the end of our meeting, she asked if she could share my name with her contacts. I told her that my only concern with all of this was that I would be used to unseat people who were actually good. Castleberry did not reply. I then said, but other than that, sure. Uh, she then commented that we have to be careful about how we do this, to which I responded, careful, how? She said, well, careful because I was accused of having a shadowy organization behind my campaign. This was very unsettling. I was told to contact Ed Randazzo. I did, and he agreed to meet with me, but right before our meeting abruptly canceled. I attempted to reschedule a meeting twice more. 
I had the sense that critical information was being withheld from me and that these people were attempting to manipulate my decision making process by lying through omission. In August, I was con August 2021. I was contacted by a trusted associate who asked me if the name Lee Schoenbeck meant anything to me. I began piecing together the puzzle pieces. I started talking with other legislators about the concerns I was having from Goodwin speaking on my behalf to Castleberry referring to the people behind my campaign as a shadowy organization. I was in extremely poor health at this time. I was not sleeping at night because I was researching. This made me late to class and made me unable to stay awake, focused and taking notes. I felt stuck in a mental fog where I was lost in a constant state of confusion. I was also extremely paranoid with the ever present fear that it would get back to them that I had been talking about them and that I knew what was going on. I could only assume that they've been gathering information to blackmail me with. I was afraid primarily of information that could be used to hurt those closest to me who did not sign up for the world of politics like my husband and I did. I feared that I would lose everything I have been working for my entire adult life. So throughout all of this, I had to let go of any expectation I had in life I almost dropped out of school because on the last day to drop classes, I was two weeks behind and having a crisis. I also did not know what the point of going to school for political science anymore was, considering my dreams in politics felt like they were over. My life felt like it was collapsing and spinning out of control. Since August, my health has taken a downturn. I experience frequent sleeplessness, waking up unable to go back to sleep, as well as being awoken with a random urge to vomit unrelated to pregnancy. I feel constantly drowsy and would find it difficult to make it through the day without heavy caffeine use or a nap. I feel constantly easily irritated with my loved ones. The evening of November 9th, I was driving home after testifying, tired for, after an emotionally taxing day, but I had no choice to keep driving because there was nowhere safe and well lit to stop. And I was also kind of paranoid. <laughs> Um, I pulled into a Stur Sturgis gas station on my way to Black Hill State University, where I ran inside to vomit. I then tried to sleep in my car, but started vomiting more. I couldn't hold down fluids, and my husband had to drive from Rapid City to take me to the emergency room. And that is the end of my uh, written complaint. Wow. And so how was that handled by legislative research council and staff? How is that personal, internal situation handled? In short, it wasn't. <laughs> it was not handled. Um, it was, I was led on, so, but it was not handled. Interesting. And so I had seen a, um, I think you had, there was something on Twitter about this exchange or an email that went back and forth, yeah. and it was sent to Amanda Marsh, correct? Yes. And that is, the current accuser of uh, Julie Fry Mueller. And so would you say that there is potentially a connection between this uh, LRC staff member and this, I, I don't know even how to describe this, cabal, I don't want to say cabal, but I mean, for lack of a better shadow organization, as Jessica Castleberry said, um, this group of individuals within the legislature that has their own sort of agenda for the state of South Dakota. Would you say that there's a connection potentially there? Absolutely. Okay, absolutely. So interesting. Um, and, and have you witnessed anything sort of beyond this that would give you that feeling? Um, no, just my own experiences. Right, okay. And that's fine if you're not mm -hmm. at liberty to share those. I, completely understand and respect that. You know, I wanted to ask as an insider and someone who has spent an uh, uh, amount of time sort of in the good graces of the boys club, as I like to call it, the in, the in crowd, what would you describe the capital culture to be like? Well, and first and foremost, in particular, towards women. I'm sorry, say that again. I said, for, for first and foremost, I call myself an outsider. Okay. <laughs> so if that gives you any idea uh, into how I kind of view um, the things that go on at the Capitol. Okay. 
have you seen I'll tell you, you know, to be to be candid, it's my understanding that there are currently four very pretty uh, lawmakers who have had experiences with the now Speaker of the House, um, Hugh Bartels, and from from my understanding. Several of these women were excused from voting for the Speaker of the House. And um, I have also heard stories about current, currently uh, sitting lawmakers who have had an abusive history, some who were caught um, in an online cheating sting type of scenario. Um, and then there's, of course, the just lack of decorum that is displayed session after session. And I I think it's interesting because, you know, decorum comes from the respect um, of the people. It's a respect of the people. If it, I have a personal issue with a colleague, it has absolutely nothing to do with how I respect and and act towards them and would be respectful of them on the House floor because that is the people's representative from another district in the state. And so that level of decorum really comes from that understanding of a respect for the Republic, for the people that have put that individual there and all personal- And the office itself. And the office, right. And all personal differences are set aside. But, but it sounds like from everything that I've heard, they're sort of this in crowd in peer and they're allowed to more or less do whatever it is that they want. And, you know, and then I've even listened to the podcast with, um, you know, Jake Schoenbeck, Lee Schoenbeck's son, where they're more or less laughing about these issues and taking this sort of victory lap. And just the cavalier attitude really shows that disparity between this privileged class of individuals and then those who are on the outs and for what you know I'm sure there are multiple reasons but you said specifically that you wouldn't want to replace somebody who was good and so I'm, I'm curious about your perspective on good you know good versus bad in in this scenario and what really separates this in crowd from those who they're clearly trying to get rid of. Hmm. Hmm. I think it really comes down to values um, because let's say, you know, I mean, Tony, he's a, he's a re representative Randolph. He's a very, very conservative guy. And you, you don't have to agree with him to respect that he is like who he is and he'll tell you who he is and you don't have to really like wonder about him having like you know some secret agenda mm. he just goes and does what he thinks is best mm. for his district and i think it really comes down to that i don't know if this other in-group has any values well <laughs> you know that at least the the leaders of that group not necessarily everyone who's involved with them because sure. some people do it because of a matter of survival because there's no way they become you know they just become yeah. another outsider like the rest of us sure. and so They're they yeah. yeah i see um, so I think it's, it's fascinating. I'm an outsider in every regard. And I thought it was, you know, absolutely stunning to see this hit list that Lee Schoenbeck had drawn up. And I was shocked when he said he was working with Governor Nome to replace these people. I finally started, you know, putting those dots together as I went back and I watched these hearings and especially March 20th, uh, 2020 or 30th, 2020 veto day when kind of everything 
began is is sort of that um, marker in my mind, uh, which was right at the right at the onset of COVID-19. And you had this group who defied the governors, so to speak, and kept the state open. And um, and you, ha you know, I was shocked to sort of see the funds that Governor Nome had raised telling this wonderful story about being brave and keeping our state open used to actually go after those who had in fact actually kept the state open. You know, it's all just so unbelievable. And um, so from your perspective, what would you tell people from outside of South Dakota who are perhaps unfamiliar with these um, nuances and they believe that South Dakota is safe and it's cherry red and if you believe in, you know, conservative values, then this is a safe place. What might, what might you say? <laughs> I would say that all roads in South Dakota lead to Denny Sanford. Mm. And that's especially true with Chrissy Nome. And that she, Denny Sanford is the reason why she folds on vaccines that, oh, well, private businesses can do whatever they want. Um, and why she won't, you know, protect women's sports, why she had to, didn't she what, water down the bill essentially so that it didn't include college sports? Is that what happened? Well, Ian Fury says that um, the bill was revised and it's, it's not meant to be a tort lawyer's dream. Those were his words to me on Twitter. But uh, for many critics, I do believe that there is some there is some criticism that either the bill really didn't change that much or it was potentially just a bit of a watered down version. Um, I've heard I've heard criticism kind of across the board on that one. Um, but I think it is interesting that after quite a bit of public pressure, she is now uh, a little bit more visible and vocal on issues like the Women in Sports Bill and now HB 1080, which just had its uh, first hearing, and that's the ban on uh, cross cross hormones for minors, I believe, right? And then it provides civil litigation, or yeah. But so that kind of goes back to again, Denny Sanford, and you know, will that bill survive? Um, because you know, Sanford didn't I read that they make money from uh, puberty blockers and these surgeries? It is uh, a $1.9 billion emerging industry, according to market research. So I'm assuming that there are many medical systems who are hoping to tap into that, those millions in, in additional revenue. Um, Carly, I'm really grateful for your time and for this inside look into capital culture and outside. the look yes. in. <laughs> an inside look from an outside perspective. Um, is there anything else that you would like to to add or to share anything you're hoping to um, illuminate individuals on before we go? Um. Hmm. Don't believe everything you see, I guess. Do your own research. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if, um, are you on Twitter? Are you on social media? Can people follow your inside perspective on things? Outside perspective. Uh, yeah. You can follow me at uh, Peer Outsider, uh, and that's on Twitter, and then The Peer Outsider on Facebook. Fantastic. All right, Carly, thank you so much. And um, hopefully we'll talk soon. I'd love to get your updates on things, especially uh, policy that's going through the legislature this session. Maybe we can do this again. Yeah. Have a good one. All right. Thank you. Thanks.